Hello, this video is a brief run through of Income Based Repayment or IBR. IBR is one of the four income driven repayment options for federal student loan borrowers. Uh, it was passed in 2007 in the College Cost Reduction and Access Act, uh, but it's only been available to borrowers since 2009. Basically, income based repayment improved upon the already existing income contingent repayment that had been around since uh, 1994 by lowering monthly payments and offering an interest subsidy. Here's how it works. In income-based repayment, your monthly payment is based on the lower of 15% of your discretionary income or the amount you'd pay under the standard 10-year uh, repayment plan. After you get done with school and when your loans enter repayment, the default repayment option is using a 10-year amortization schedule. In other words, after making 120 qualifying payments or one payment each month for 10 years, you pay off your entire uh, principal balance. The income driven repayment options give borrowers flexibility by lower their monthly payments based on their uh, adjusted gross income. So in income based repayment, the calculation of discretionary income is a little bit different than under income contingent repayment and is actually a little bit borrower friendly. In income contingent repayment, you take your adjusted gross income and subtract the federal poverty line for the number of people living in your household in the area where you live. In income-based repayment, you take your AGI, but you subtract 150% of the federal poverty line. So the federal poverty line is published by the Department of Health and Human Services, and it's revised every couple years for inflation. Uh, you can look up what it is in your area on their website. Here's an example. Let's say that you get out of school and enter repayment with $100,000 in federal student loans at 6% interest. You get a job that pays you $50,000 a year. This works out to be $4,167 per month on a gross basis before taxes. If you enter the standard 10-year repayment plan, again, this is the default option when your loans uh, enter repayment, your monthly payment would be a little more than $1,100 per month. That's a little bit more than 25% of your gross income, which could be a huge burden on uh, borrowers just entering the workforce. Let's say you enter income-based repayment to give yourself a little bit more financial flexibility. You've got an adjusted gross income of $50,000. Assuming that you're single and live in the, in the lower 48, the poverty line in your area is $11,880, 150% of which is $17,820. Subtract that from your adjusted gross income, you get $32,180. Cut that in 12, you get a monthly discretionary income of $2,682, 15% of which is $402.25. So you've effectively lowered your monthly payment from over $1,110 a month to $402.25. Not a bad deal. Now, just like the other three income-driven repayment options, IBR offers forgiveness of any remaining loan balance you have after 25 years. Now, remember, you have to make qualifying payments for 20, each month for 25 years in order to qualify, and any amount that's forgiven is considered taxable income. So if you're planning on having your loans forgiven after entering IBR for 25 years, you have to be on the lower end of the income spectrum for this to work, Make sure you plan for uh, a, a big tax hit once that remaining amount is forgiven. Now, IBR was revised in 2014 in an attempt to conform with pay as you earn, which was rolled out in 2012. Basically, IBR separates new borrowers and old borrowers as of July 1st, 2014. If you're considered a new borrower, Rather than having your payments based on 15% of your discretionary income, they're only based on 10% of your discretionary income. Additionally, the forgiveness period is shortened to 20 from 25 years. So here's an example. Let's use all the parameters from our first example. You have an AGI of $50,000, you're single, you live in the lower 48. Your monthly discretionary income is going to be $2,682. 10% of that is $268.20. So if you're, if you're a new borrower as of July 1st, 2014, 
your monthly payment, your minimum monthly payment, you can always pay more than that if you wish, is 268.20. If you're not, it's going to be that 402.25. Just like pay as you earn an income contingent repayment, the calculation of, of discretionary income is going to include the adjusted gross income of your spouse if you file taxes jointly. Now, if your spouse if your spouse makes considerably more money than you do and you want to keep your payments lower, you might consider filing your taxes separately because this will allow you to exclude them from your calculation of discretionary income. Now, there's some other tax implications when you do that. Uh, usually, you pay a little bit more in, in net tax by filing separately than you do jointly. Not everybody can qualify for IBR, though. In order to qualify, you have to have a partial financial hardship, which means that your monthly payment under IBR is lower than it otherwise would be under the standard 10-year repayment plan. You also have to have eligible loans. Not every single loan is eligible. Uh, for example, loans made to parents, Parent PLUS and FEL loans made to parents, are not eligible for income-based repayment. Interest capitalization is another important topic here. And remember that if we go with the standard 10-year repayment plan, you're going to have your loans paid off in full after 10 years. Well, if you enter an income-driven repayment plan, by definition, you're going to have a partial financial hardship, meaning that your monthly payment is going to be lower and it will take longer to repay your loans. It's also possible that the interest that accrues on your loans each month is greater than your monthly payment under income-based repayment. And if that's the case, you'll have the, the difference between those two will accrue in interest each month. But that interest won't be added to your loan balance unless it's capitalized. Under income-based repayment, there's a couple different scenarios where interest is capitalized. In income contingent repayment, it's automatically capitalized every year. But in income-based repayment, uh, there are certain events that trigger capitalization. If your income rises beyond the point where you no longer have a partial financial hardship, that means that your interest is going to be capitalized and added to the balance of your loan. You can still stay in IBR and your, pay and your monthly payment would be capped at what it would have been under the 10-year plan, but any accrued interest will be capitalized and added to your loans. This is also the case if you don't recertify your income one year or if you leave the program entirely. So one of the big improvements over income contingent repayment is the interest subsidy. So let's say that under income-based repayment, your monthly payment is not as much as the interest that's accruing on your loans every month. That, that accrued interest builds over time. Well, under income-based repayment, there's an interest subsidy. So on any subsidized loans that you have that are accruing interest, the government will pay that amount for you for the first three years you're in the program. After three years, they don't pay it, and any unsubsidized loans, they don't pay it for you either. So that does it for our brief rundown of income-based repayment. IBR is still a great option if you're trying to take advantage of the cap on monthly payments and you don't qualify for pay-as-you-earn. Also, be sure to subscribe to Above the Canopy and get free access to the Financial Independence Vault. The Financial Independence Vault contains tons of free premium content to help you make good financial decisions and avoid making mistakes, not just on student loans, but other aspects of personal finance too.